o'clock, and I do not want to waste your time. We, uh, for you this guys, meeting is being recorded. Sorry, Dad, this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> so, um, welcome everybody here to the May 12th Oak Creek Fire Protection District Board of Directors meeting. And we will start off with the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Miss Melissa, would you mind leading this? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right. Roll we'll call of board members. Director Devaney is here, Director Baker is here, Director Woods is here, and Director Wagner is on his way. And we do have a quorum, so we'll, we will be able to begin. The um, My fellow board members, if you've had a chance, would you please look at the agenda? I would like to make one um, correction. We will move the election update from new business into old business. And once our district's attorney, John Camille, arrives, he will be able to provide that. He, too, is stuck in traffic and an auto accident. So we will move uh, item number one from new business to item number two in old business. Any other additions um, or corrections to the agenda? Um, I have one. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> on the tail end of my report, we're actually going to have uh, Jason Papenthus, our modulator, okay. give kind of an overview of our wildland program, uh, just for everybody, they, they keep talking about it. So I'm not sure if that should be on my report or under new business. Um, well, uh, I would say that it should be under your report, because we've already had the wildland updates. Perfect. If um, my yeah. fellow board members would have been in agreement, we've had those in the Wonderful. Past. Okay. I would like to add um, now number three under new business. Or, yes. Yeah, House Bill, I believe it's 121, 22-121. Or no, it would be 21-121. I'll confirm the number before we get there regarding um, accessibility and websites. Okay. House Bill 1110. Is it 1110? Yeah. I knew I was up and I remember I'm watching another one now. Okay, so it's House Bill 21-1110. Yes. Okay. Right. Any other? Any other additions or uh, deletions to the agenda? Had a chance to look at the uh, minutes. Um, can't perhaps we have not had a chance. But could we look at that real quick? And then, once, if there are no additions or corrections, and we will try to accept a motion to approve the minutes from April 2022. Sorry, what's that? I would like to Request a rewording of citizens issue 2C. Okay. Uh, item number 2C? Yeah. Okay. Um, change of language from should to could and a recommendation that. Okay. So reading would be a recommendation that next door and social media postings could be increased. Okay. Additions to the or corrections to the minutes from April 22. 
last time. Any other additions or corrections to the minutes from April 2022? Hearing none, I'll accept a motion to approve the minutes from April 2022. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Motion passes. All right, that takes us to item number six. Director Woods and her fabulous financial matters. Well, I have to say so because we have not had them presented this way in my time on the board. So, um, the projector, the graphs are projected on the screen instead of sending copies out. Copies out. Um, so, I'll ask Tom Ben when he needs to scroll to the next graph. The first graph is total revenue. So it's overall revenue, that would include all types of revenue. Uh, the budget is $5,800,935, which is what you see up top in the blue line. The green line is the revenue, year-to-date revenue for the month of April, which is $1,865,303. The month of April was $317,000, down quite a bit from the month of March because March is when we get most of our property tax revenue coming in. So it takes a little bit of a dip in April. Um, your debate still looks reasonably good. Um, any questions about revenue before we move on to the next graph on this page? Everyone's quiet, so. It's a good sign. Good sign. Then if you could scroll down to the dispense <clears throat> Okay, expenses, the budget for expenses, total expenses for 2022, 5790914 Expenses for the month of April, which I'll ask for a motion later in the meeting, 237962.94. And the year to date number, which is what you're looking at, is 1254688 rounded to the nearest dollar. Any questions about it? You can see that overall expenses are trending. Overall expenses are trending lower than forecasted. So that's good news. We'll talk about that in more detail a little bit later. Can everybody hear me? Because I don't talk for a while. Yeah, you're pretty. Okay, here's some pretty next to me. <laughs> okay. Ben, if you could scroll to the next graph on this page. Okay. This is a net income graph that changed this up a little bit and we talked about it last um, meeting. So this is a comparison of not a forecasted net income, but net income this year versus net income for 2021. The tracking okay, the tracking a little below income from last year. And it's not alarming, but just take note. Net income for the year is the number that you see of 610,616. Again, that's going to come down because the total budget for net income is 10,021. The reason that comes down is because of the way that we receive revenue. Most of our revenue comes in March for property taxes, which is our biggest number. So I would expect that number to pick up a little bit in July because we get a second round of property taxes in July, less than we get in March, but again, it should take up in July, which is what the graph shows for next year. Any questions about that? Nobody cares, right? Okay. I care. I care. Yeah, we do care. <laughs> okay, we can go to the next page, which might be a little tougher to get these graphs on because they're bigger. Property, since property tax revenue is our biggest revenue number, I'll discuss it a little bit. That's the monthly number. Part of the reason that that looks funny like that for the month is because last year, which is what I based the, the spread for 2022, they missed sending us our property taxes in March. And so the March number there looks a little bit higher than we normally see it. Normally you'd see a dive. In March because we don't get much in March or April. Or, I'm sorry, we get a lot in March, but we don't get much in April. So 
The Monday number was a little squirrely, but it was scrolled on then to the, the annual mm -hmm. one. Looks a little bit. Looks a little bit. Because it trends a little bit better. So we're pretty much right on with property tax revenue forecast for 2022. We're at, our forecast is at 1,701,000. And we came in at 1,691. We can't get a whole lot closer than that. It's really very close. So I think our forecast is reasonable, um, especially when you start looking at the year to date number. It's very reasonable. Any questions about property tax revenue? Any questions? Okay. Let's go to the next page. And um, then I might have to go, might have to have you go between the pages, but the next page is labor. This is all in labor. And you can see that it's tracking monthly a little bit higher than we forecasted. But again, remember that I base the forecast, the monthly forecast, on the spread from 2021. There could be some idiosyncrasies there. But that's about the best bet in terms of forecasting how revenue tracks in 2022 and 2021. So if you look at the year to date, remember we scroll down just a little bit then. There we go. Keep going. Oh. Keep going. That will stop. Stop. Keep it now. So you can again you can see that overall we are tracking higher in labor, in overall labor. But keep in mind, which is why we're going to go to the next page, because the next page talks about the fact that, there we go, scroll all the way down to the because that, I like the year to date that better. It makes more sense. Thank you. So, what happens with the surf expenses? They are reimbursed by the state. So, you see that the numbers get closer together, because we get that money back. We get an all in labor amount back from the state for, what's it called again, Chief? It's reimbursable expenses for services rendered to other places. Correct. Uh, fire assignments, uh, natural disasters, whatever assignments that they go out on. Yeah. So what we see is the labor number gets closer because we get that money back. So I'm depicting this graph with and without the SERP expenses. The SERP expenses for year to date this year were about 30,000. So we actually had reimbursable expenses in January, February, March, and April. So we're at 30,000. That includes labor and operational type expenses. So we will get that money back. Barbara is going to be filing with the state pretty soon asking for our money, right? <laughs> so give me our money. The other thing is next month, I'm going to look at not only the reimbursable expenses for SERP, but also I'm going to look at reimbursable expenses for the um, intergovernmental agreements that we have with Intercanada. Because again, those get reimbursed, they're not reflected in our labor number, and that's a big part of our number. So I want people to be able to see the difference between those two. Um, I didn't get time, unfortunately, to do that this month. I will next month. So, um, if you want any questions on what I'm going to do and what I am doing in terms of trying to understand labor number, because people look at this and go, oh, it's high. Well, yeah, but we get some of that money back. So, it's not as high as it is, if that makes sense. Anyway. Um, so, to wrap up, revenue is on track. Labor's a bit higher, but again, next month I'm not going to only, sh I'm only going to show. We show the IGA reimbursable expenses and also the um, CERP reimbursable expenses. Um, and also the fuels group will be reimbursed. So I'm going to be taking those amounts out of the labor actual numbers so that people can actually see what's, what's really happening. Um, fire expenses will get higher this year to date because we had a big fire, big house fire on Wandley. And um, so, yeah, time. so overtime was pretty high for fire expenses this month. Expenses overall, um, we've got a couple. The reason expenses are a little higher, I mean a little lower, is because we have some expenses that haven't hit yet that have been forecasted. 
In training, we're going to hire a deputy chief, and those numbers aren't reflected in our actual numbers yet. And um, admin, we have a fairly substantial budget for legal expenses, and we have a fairly substantial budget for human resources and liability. And none of those actual expenses have hit yet. So that's another reason why expenses are tracking a little bit lower. Any questions? Did I make, did I make some sense? Yeah. No, okay. Sense. Yeah. okay, so I'm going to take a motion to approve the total expenses for the month of April of $237,962.94. Repeat that number, please. Uh huh. $237,962.94. A motion. I move to approve the expenditures of two thirty-seven nine sixty-two ninety-three. And a second. Second. All in favor. Aye. The motion passes. Thank you all for your attention to a very boring accounting. <laughs> uh, Director Woods, I will reiterate this is so beneficial for us, and uh, we thank you very much for the Thanks, time you dedicated to that. All right, that takes us to item number seven. Um, and our first item at number seven is Chief Ward's report. Uh, sorry, we're, we're utilizing some new multimedia here to make these new meetings a little more palatable. So we're, we're kind of learning we have this OWL device here, and I am fairly new to it. Uh, it actually has a 360 degree camera. So there's a microphone as well as a speaker. So it'll focus on whoever's speaking as well as, so the people who are remote actually get a much better experience than the very poor recording straight from my laptop. Oh, that'd be nice. Yeah, it's so cool, because it isolates and shows who's speaking and when they're speaking and then across the top bar, which you can change. It shows the entire panoramic view. So wow. Dom's the RSME with this, so she's helping me. So, apologies. <laughs> what I can see, right. it looks fine. All right. So I have a shorter report this month and the effort to respect every time since we're going to have Jason Papakis discuss the wildland program. So we are full in summer weather now-ish. Uh, we're starting to green up. We have a lot of wind, the endless wind that has been, uh, it's, it's drying us out pretty significantly. Our fire danger is slowly increasing. We have had two fires. Um, both have been tremendous stops. They, they were held very small, acre, acre and a half. Interesting, interestingly enough, the second fire we had burned into a Colorado State Forest Service mitigation project, which kept it kept behavior low. Burned right up to a house. I think it was probably two feet from a house. Was that? Uh, no, it didn't burn his house. It's really not good. Yeah, I mean it was it was significant. It was it was proof of concept of fire mitigation. We're trying to put together a little package and a little presentation on it, but yeah. unbelievably lucky. Um, and the firefighters were very good. So the combination of the mitigation, quick response, very heavy response from all the agencies, kept it small. And actually, that's two fires where firefighters have actually legitimately saved some structures, which is pretty exciting. Uh, we've also been able to send some resources out. We've been taking advantage of uh, our lower fire danger here. You know, obviously, we're having fires, but they're not going big yet. We're still in green up. Uh, so we, we've sent some resources down to, uh, we sent an engine up to Nebraska as well as New Mexico. We've got a few other single resources out. Uh, they went to Texas and we've got some people in New Mexico. And the hiring process is proceeding with 15 individuals moving along to the ride-along component. Uh, it is pretty exciting to have 15 good applicants for this process. Um, it's. I think it's proof of kind of what we've got going on that people want to come here, which is, it should be good. But, uh, the goal is to have those two people onboarded by the end of June. So we had 110 hours of staffing with Station 1. Uh, we averaged 3.3 members per call. 27% uh, of our calls overlap and our average response time was a little less at 10.59. Uh, Everything was about normal, uh, 118 runs, which obviously is up from 2021. It was a busy month. Uh, we did have three fires. EMS is about normal. Uh, moving in mutual aid, mutual aid is the same. It is interesting. Ambulance transports keep trending down. Uh, 28 transports for 67 EMS calls. It's, it's, it keeps going down more and more. 
Yesterday we had three motor vehicle accidents with a total of how many PCRs were written yesterday? Twelve. Twelve out of three motor vehicle accidents, and there were two transports. Very interesting. And those were the two highway speed, and that was the highway speed accidents. Everything else, I mean, it's a testament to newer cars, safety, but it, it is. Our, our transports are trending down. That was one director with that had, had asked about that, and it, yeah. yesterday was it was interesting because that fell right into our conversation. Yeah. Chief, real quick, jumping back up to hazardous conditions, there's yeah. a market increase there. Is that just an anomaly? Well, a lot of those uh, were the special weather with the significant amount of wind we've had. We've had a lot of energized power lines down, and in the end, first that was what ends up the hazardous condition, no fire. Um, we had, down by the box farm, we actually had an energized line, it got ripped off a pole, landed in the creek, so it didn't ground out. Oh. And so it was live, running across the road. Um, a lot of, that that's what the bulk of them are. We, we've had a tremendous amount of trees on power lines. Yeah, our power's been out a lot. Yeah. I mean, today, I think there were four trees on power lines, kind of around here, between all the yeah. districts. It, I think the trees are getting weakened from all the, from all the constant wind and Right. Lack. Yeah, the lack of moisture, and I think they're just going to continue to fall. Uh, one interesting sidebar is CORE actually has a system in place now on red flag days where they turn the sensitivity up on the power lines. Yeah. For instance, a call we had today, there was a tree across the power line. The tree had scorch marks on it, but the sensitivity is turned up to where it de-energizes the system so quickly that there was no fire. The tree didn't burn across. There were scorch marks on it from where it bridged both the hot and the neutral but it shut everything down. Wow. Pretty That's exciting cool. technology. Okay. Um, That's fantastic. Yeah, it, it was pretty good. Uh, training, we only had 99 hours of training this month only because the Rookie Academy hasn't been entered yet. Um, the Rookie Academy is now working in hazmat and their final testing will be in June. Wildland Fire Suppression Module and the Fuels Crew is gonna finish up with their 80 hours of critical training and be available on May 17th. Fire Prevention. Uh, the ambassador program is doing really well. They're starting to get into a lot, holding meetings for their planning units. We just had an uh, ambassador meeting here a couple nights ago. Very successful. I believe there were 18 people that came from two neighborhoods. A lot of interest, a lot of great questions. It really seems like it's program is starting to take traction inside the community. Uh, we're, in, we're exploring a saws and slaws program within that, if you guys are familiar with that. No. Park County is doing it. It started in Boulder County. What it is, is communities getting together to help uh, residents within their planning unit who can't do the work on their own. They either have physical limitations, financial limitations, you know, they want to do the work, but they can't do it. And so everybody in the community gets together, does a bunch of work on the property, and then the whole thing with saws and slaws, everybody comes in, does all the cutting, does all the slash dragging, and then has a potluck at the end of it. Over in, uh, in, I can't remember what neighborhood it is over in Black Canyon. Berland. Berland. They they have they're having a tremendous success. I think they're on their fourteenth or fifteenth. Fourteenth or fifteenth project. Uh, it's worked out really well. I've helped out with some of the saw work. Um, it's just it's it's a really solid community program, and I'm hoping that that'll keep going over here. The CWPP is done. We got all our signatures, and the final version is up on the website. We got it signed by all our stakeholders which is actually pretty interesting. Some other agencies didn't get final signatures on their final product, so I'm pretty happy that we got it. Uh, fleet and equipment, uh, we did, as we mentioned last month, we were going to deviate again from the fire department norm of giant, buying giant pickups. We purchased a hybrid Ford Escape. Uh, it's working out really well. It is getting right around 35 to 38 miles to the gallon around here versus the 12 we get in the larger pickups for, you know, just the runabout vehicle stuff. Um, it's pretty exciting. I think we're going to keep looking towards more economical vehicles where they fit. I don't think the traditional one-ton truck is exactly what we need for everything. Um, and that actually, under new business, I'm going to talk about that as well. We're going to try and surplus a couple vehicles here that are going to be some albatrosses. And the insurance work on the engine and the tender, that's, that's ongoing. We got the insurance back. And now they're starting to work, the parts are on orders. So we should have hopefully everything back at the end of June. Any questions on that? Can we have a quick spot? Yes, ma'am. 
Because you're going to discuss grants and mitigation contracts. Oh, yeah, I can definitely do that. I wasn't sure that I was, uh, yeah. I yep. I was going to try to report On it. So, Thank Director you. Woods actually asked me, because we, we had talked about <clears throat> grants when we did the budget. And so we had mitigation contracts. I, we had earmarked a uh, line item number of 64, 64,000 for some of the mitigation contracts. And then as a lot of the infrastructure money started trickling down, I started talking about what we're going to have to do. We're probably going to have to do a budget amendment just due to some of the grants that are probably going to be coming in. I didn't want to put those in because, yet again, they're grants and they're fickle. You know, by the time the money, the infrastructure money may trickle down to Jefferson County, there may be $8.50 in there. So we didn't put any of that in, but what we've got going on right now, so the Furworm grant, that was one we received last year. That was the joint grant that we did with Inner Canyon. That was for the $2,500 matching cost share with property for mitigation. Um, where that's going to go is that's going to go down in the Hilldale, Plat Pine, Hilldale Pines planning unit. Now, granted, that's not our district, but as we've expanded this, this project, that was identified in the CWCP, and that fit really well with that grant. The next ones we're going to have, we're going to try and make sure they're coming into our district. But that's part of the partnership with, we're doing with Inner Canyon. Um, so that's going to start, I believe, the actual award amount was $262,250. And so that's going to be able to be matched 50-50 with property owners. Uh, we also got $12,500 for Kelly McConaughey, our mitigation specialist, for her assessments of those properties. And that essentially is just going to be passed through. But yet again, that is going to be money that's going to pass through us, so we'll have to account for that in our budget as revenue. That's one of the things that, once we start moving that, we'll have to look at how much we're going to do and what that line item is going to look like, just so at the end it doesn't look like we overspend just by having the money coming through. The next one is the big one, the coast lot money. The coast lot money, that's, that's part of essentially the infrastructure grant that's coming down. We have applied for it uh, in partnership with Inner Canyon as well as uh, Jefferson County. So uh, our own Ben Yellen was integral in writing it with John Mandel. Uh, the county didn't have anybody with the specialized skills to actually come up with the application quite like these guys did, so they wrote it. And what we're going to do is the grant uh, two grants were submitted jointly for two million in, within Jefferson County. You know, big number. Uh, now, five hundred twenty-five thousand will be for a defensible space within the Elk Creek, Inner Canyon, and Evergreen area. It's going to be the same business model as the Furworm with the matching for defensible space. Two hundred thousand will be to support the county with planning, inventory, and assessment. So that's going to be look at a lot of land use planning and what they have in place and what could be better in the future. And then fifty percent will be indirect for Elk Creek to facilitate the grant. So we're going to be the financial the fiscal agents for this grant, and that's going to be for our admin fees in running it through. Um, some of the big things about that is we're going to, they're going to, uh, Open Space has directed a bunch of money to mitigation on their parks, which is going to benefit us directly. We have a lot of open space within our district that is woefully in need of fire mitigation. So open space is really stepping up to the plate. They've been criticized pretty heavily on it. And they're going to be doing a lot of work. And we're going to be working with them to get this done. We're not going to be doing the work, but hopefully we're going to be directing. And the goal is to make open space where it butts into private residences to make that safer. Is Denver Mountain Parks participating with you guys at all on any of this? Because um, they have significant correct. land assets up here, too. It, they are, they're, they're a part of it. They are helping. They've actually started doing a lot more. They they yeah. they didn't do a lot for a number of years, and over the last few years, they 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 started as well. I mean, almost everybody has. I mean, you almost have to. It's almost irresponsible if you're not being part of mitigation as a landowner up here, yeah. you know, especially a large public landowner. Uh, the Upper South Platte Partnership. We have thirty-one thousand dollars for work uh, done at the Fuels Crew at Douglas Ranch in the preserve at Pine Meadows. So that. Will we be collecting that this year, or is that next year? Yeah, so that's the goal, is to have that in there. Um, Foxton, we finished that project, and we're working on the paperwork, so we're going to have $17,000 coming in for that project. These are mitigation contracts, right? Correct. Okay. And these, these are all the ones that I was talking about that are going to be having to start offsetting that number. So the grants that you just talked about, when do we kind of expect that number to start coming in? Um, There's a significant 
difference in timelines. Oh, no, I know. But we talked about it last year, and it's yeah. 2022 now. Correct. Um, so the, the reimbursement paperwork for Foxton, I don't know when we'll see that. We should see that this year. Okay. The work is completed right now. It's, it, it's, it's in paperwork. Um, same with the Upper South Lot Partnership for that uh, grant at the Ranch and Preserve of Pine Meadows. Uh, Glen Elk, that, that should be this year. You know, we're, The goal is to have the work completed. We've got a pretty solid timeline to get that completed. Once it's completed, it'll be hung up in paperwork bill, which is a black hole that is complicated. Uh, Glen Elk, that was another forward budget, uh, forward grant that we got. That's the, Glen Elk is a neighborhood kind of at the top of the canyon above the Bucksmart, you know, South Elk Creek Road, where it goes down there. We've been doing a tremendous amount of work in there. The total budget is 150000 for that. And the split is between the module. The module's been working out there for almost a year now. It started, I believe, last year. And working on that. And then that's going to be split with contractors for defensible space because we don't work around houses. There's a lot of very technical tree removal down there. As, as Captain Yellen said, that of all the places to start, we probably pick the most technical and the most complex just based on the topography and the trees. The trees are fairly large with the drainage there and all the moisture. Uh, we also had, uh, I did speak to this grant a couple months ago. We got it. It's the uh, Firefighter Disease, uh, Safety and Disease Prevention Grant. That's twenty thousand dollars. That's a fifty-fifty match for new bunker gear. So we're able to spend, uh, we're going to spend about forty-two thousand dollars on new bunker gear. Um, I think we're going to be able to get fifteen sets somewhere around there. Thirteen sets for new bunker gear for firefighters. Um, we should have that grant done. That one will also come in this year. Uh, we, we've got the approval and we're making we're ordering the products hopefully in the next month or so and then we should get that done. How's that? that that's that's kind of what we have right now. Um, and as we as these start coming in, like I said, uh, I, I think we'll probably have to have a pretty good sit down to decide how we're gonna make that work into the budget so it doesn't look like we've overspent, just because we're gonna have a lot of money coming in and a lot of money going out. Granted, it's not going to affect our bottom line at all, but it's just in and out in the budget. Can and you do a pass-through amendment? That's one of the things we talked about. I don't know if that's the best way to do it because we're only passing through on the Coast Law Grant. We're okay. not passing all of it through. We're passing portions of portions. it through, and some of it's going directly to us. So I, I don't, I'm not savvy enough on that to know if that would be the way to handle that. Not if you're keeping because we are getting a pretty if fair amount of it. If we're benefiting from a portion of it, then I think we are. Yeah. I was going to say, it's a first world problem. <laughs> it's a good problem to have. It is. It, it is. We, we've done really well. Um, and yet yeah, again, that's assessment to Captain Yellen's work and Captain Mandel at Inner Canyon. They've been very successful with a lot of these. Um, if I may, just for a second, Captain Yellen, I didn't get a chance to acknowledge, applaud, thank you, and your partner for your presentation at the town hall meeting. It was fantastic. Appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> Everybody. Yeah, that was good. All right, and the last part was I didn't really put anything in about wildland because I wanted. Our module leader, Jason Papadopoulos, to kind of discuss what we have, because we, we have a lot of programs. In every every month during my report, I touch on little bits and pieces of the programs, but I don't think we've ever laid out the whole thing. Um, it's not going to take a tremendous amount of time, probably 10 to 15 minutes, but he can explain what our wildland programs are instead of me just hitting on the highlights. Ah, there he is. I knew he was coming. Right. He left. He was running. <laughs> <Afternoon>. <laughs> All right, so I appreciate uh, you giving me the opportunity. I won't take up too much of your time, although I'm pretty passionate about our program. We've talked about it all day. I'll try and keep it between 10 and 15 minutes. So um, I guess the first thing for anybody who doesn't know who I am uh, or any of the board members I haven't had a chance to talk to you directly, my name is Jason Papenpuss. Um I started in fire in 2008. Uh, I kind of worked around uh, all different sides of the emergency services, from the hospitals and ambulances and the big red trucks with ladders on them and the big red ones with pumps in them. And then 
Uh, over the course of my career, uh, I became more and more involved in wildfire. Uh, so from working and you know crew work on the ground, local county crew, and working on the different types of engines that go out and fight wildfires, it became more and more clear to me uh, that wildfires are the single greatest threat uh, that we face in the West. Um, so I made a difficult decision with a wife and two kids to transition my career into more uh, dedicated wildland fire uh, due solely to demand and the need for people who are addressing those problems. Um, one of the reasons I came to Elk Creek is because, uh, one, I worked with Chief Ware on a fire and I was impressed with Elk Creek, and two, uh, something I'll touch on a couple more times um, in, in my chat, is that this is this uh, area is in the 99th percentile for uh, potential wildfire losses in the country, not just the state. Um, and so I'm here because I believe in the work that we're doing and the belief that, that uh, we, especially the local government agency, have uh, uh, responsibility to address these problems the best we can. Um, so in the overview, I'll talk a little bit about the operations of what we're doing, a little bit about the history of our crews and what we've been doing since 2017, uh, and a brief overview of the mitigation uh, projects we have on the ground and some of the response capabilities that we have. Um, so history for the crew, uh, I have pictures, because pictures are fun. So uh, history for the crew, uh, I called uh, Chief Ware in 2017. Um, just on a whim and say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm interested in Elk Creek and I'm interested in what I can help do with the district. And we, he happened to have been greenlit for a project that's, uh, that was uh, uh, facing the same direction that I was looking to take my career. Um, so I started here in 2017 with one person, uh, uh, myself and, and a coworker and a chipper. Uh, and we drove around and we chipped slash and we responded to fires and we reduced hazard mitigation. Um, the response from the community was great that we were providing the services and that we were addressing these problems. And so over the course of the next few years, uh, just due to the fact that this is such a, this is such a daunting task and, and frankly we can't put enough people to work in the forests around here, uh, our crew grew into what we called an initial attack squad, which was a, a crew of uh, four that was geared towards fire mitigation as well as being geared towards um, fire response and initial attack. Uh, and then it grew uh, once again into the full 10-person module that we have. So again, these grow these these steps as we grew were in response to the need for the work, the, the need for fire response, and the endless amount of work that we've got up here to do. Um, in 2020, uh, 2021, sorry, the beginning of last year, uh, we entered that partnership with Inner Canyon uh, again because of the demand of work, and we essentially faced that choice of what is it that we're trying to do up here. Do we want one? Do we want the other as far as fire response or mitigation, or do we want both? Um, and so with Inner Canyon's partnership, we decided that we would be able to, we, we should do both. We have the responsibility to do both. And the fuels crew was started in 2020, uh, 2021. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about the fuels crew and what it is and the difference between the module and the fuels crew. But that's basically a brief overview of, uh, of our programs. And Billy Gage is back there. He came on 2019 with me. He's got 14 years of fire experience all over the West. And he brings a tremendous amount of wildfire experience and expertise to the area. And he's the assistant for the module. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're lucky to have people like him. Yeah, you're good. Okay, so with mitigation work, um, a couple of things that I want to touch on. Um, you know, I already discussed that we went from, you know, two people and a chipper. And I want to touch on a couple of points of what we had what we grew into, what we have now, and the difference of the capabilities that those things offer the community. Uh, so what we had was two people, a chipper. We didn't have a chipper truck, so we broadcast chips back on the property. And you were basically just reorienting fuel from standing where they can get 40, 50, 100 foot flame lengths. And we reoriented them to chipped material. And that was better than nothing, right? So we were going around and chipping and reducing that fire hazard by reducing the overall flame length and the, and the fire hazard in the event of a wildfire. Um, as we've grown, we started. We, we began to get involved in cut projects, which were aimed at thinning out overgrown forests. And I won't get into all the wildfire forest health stuff. I'm sure that everybody's already enamored in that and living up here. Um, but our projects, our cut projects, are aimed at either reducing overgrown forests, placing actionable points on a map that can be used in the event of a wildfire. So shaded fuel breaks, uh, defensible space around homes. These are things that we would have on a map after they're complete, like the Glen Elk project. And if a fire is burning into that area, we now have a point on a map that's already in place that we can use to put a, a stop to the fire before it gets into the community. We also have 
a similar project that's in the earlier phases. We're, you know, we're in phase three, but we've been taking small chunks out of it for the last four years. And that's the one around Douglas Ranch that's aimed at a similar uh, end goal of putting a uh, defensible point on a map to where if, in the event of a southwest push from wildfire, which is what we tend to get in the, in the Rockies here, uh, we can put crews on the ground and much of the work that needs to be done to be able to defend those areas is already done. Um, some of the other ones we have, uh, you know, around the preserve area, we did 50 acres of mitigation. It was pretty grueling work on steep slopes and it was to reduce overgrown brush. So the juniper up here burns like kerosene under the right conditions. And in there we had continuous seas of 20 foot brush. Um, so the crews reduced those. They, they cut 100% of the, uh, the juniper was what the parameters were for the project, which was grueling. And then the best way to process that is to stack, pile, and burn it when there's a bunch of snow on the ground. So that's one of our, the other projects that we've got going on. And then the chipping program uh, is one that the fuels crew is now running. The reason that we have the fuels crew running it is because I cannot keep up with the demand of the chipping program. And so uh, we've got a crew that's now dedicated to that. They also multi multitask in fire response, which I'll go over and touch briefly on. Uh, but they maintain the chipping program, and they're also participating in some of those cut projects that we have. So really, it's kind of like a, trying to be an octopus. And I tell my guys all the time, I'm not an octopus. I can't do eight things at once. But we have structured our programs with significant support from the board, from Chief Ware and under his leadership, and under Captain, Yell Captain Yellen's leadership with the Wildland Division to where we're now firing on all cylinders when it comes to trying to address the problems up here. And frankly, it's still not enough. So we're doing the best we can, and we're working as hard as we can in the, in, in the hopes that it is going to make a difference when a wildfire does hit the ground. Um, so with that, I kind of want to tail into uh, your wildfire response that we're getting from these resources. Because again, like I said, in the beginning of these programs, a lot of it was, was focused on, yes, we hired firefighters. I came here as a firefighter with 10 years of, of firefighting history behind me so that I could fight, fight fires when they did start. Um, but a lot of it was also catered towards mitigation and reducing fuels. The problem with just reducing fuels is that when the fire does come, we have to be able to, to perform a, a, re, a response to try and keep the, the fire small while they are small. Um, so. Your wildfire response that you're getting is that the module is at this point truly a highly trained wildfire response resource. They're about as highly trained as they come um, and they're competitive with some of the best crews out there. We run them through a very rigorous training program every year and this year we're pretty proud that the seasonal employees that we do come do get in, uh, you know, usually that's high attrition positions where people are running through those positions because it is seasonal in nature. We got 100% returning from crews that worked last year. So we have zero new firefighters on the module. Every one of them is going into at least their third season. Um, and some of them have, are, have come back multiple seasons. One of them that we have back this season started with us in 2019, worked his tail off for a couple of years, run the chipping program, chipped thousands of slash piles, hundreds of chipping requests, as well as fighting wildfires for us. Took a brief season off, and then he came back, which says to me a lot about our programs and makes me pretty proud. So. The module is a highly trained wildfire response resource, and that's what you're getting out of them. They're also performing those mitigation projects, and they're a pretty heavy hitting resource when it comes to that. Um, but that's really their, their, what they're geared towards, is being a highly trained resource to be able to quickly fight fire, keep it small, and then in the event that a fire does go bigger, they're trained to be able to respond to those fires as well, to try and keep the fire as small as we can possibly keep. The fuels crew, again, heavy, heavy, uh, orientation towards fuels reduction, hazard fuel mitigation, cutting, the chipping program, and they're also doing a lot of work with fuel sampling, which is, we use fuel, it's just the fancy word for vegetation. Uh, they go out and they, they're collecting fuels on a regular basis, they bake it, they figure out what the fuel moisture is, and then we can get an idea for what our local fire dangers are. Because as of right now, there's no, no none of that work being done locally, and we don't have a good cross-section of what our district looks like and how to appropriate staffing decisions based on that. So that's another one of the resources that they're given. And we've also got multiple other mitigation projects in, in the works. Um, and then the last thing I want to touch on in you know, supporting the wildfire response is the training that leads to being able to provide accurate or to provide high level wildfire resources on a fire. Um, so what we do with that right now, tomorrow is the last day of what we call critical 80 training. The fuels crew and the module both go through this. It's 80 hours of 
highly specialized wildfire training to prepare these guys so that when we do have a wildfire, they know exactly what to do. Uh, and also to create a, a tight-knit, cohesive crew because wildfire is a team exercise. It's not, it's not a solo exercise. And so by the time a criti critical 80 is done, these folks have been through intense training. They know their jobs. They know each other. And they're working together as a smooth, well-oiled machine. And that's, that's the goal. And we do have that for this year. Like I said, tomorrow's the last day, and they're doing a great job. Um, Chief, we already touched on a couple of things with resources that go out of district. And the module is one of those that under the right conditions, when the, when the fire danger is lower, we do send them out of district, and I take those guys to go fight fires elsewhere. Um, and the reason I'm bringing that up is because it's a question that I get from a lot of folks. Um, first off, if the module's out of district, the fuels crew is a dedicated in-district resource. And they're also just as highly trained as the module, and they're capable of fire response. Uh, but, the, but the thing I try to get everybody on board with and, uh, and to understand is that there's, there's an inherent district, uh, difference in the way we train for structure fire and the way we train for wildfire. Okay, I can train a bunch of structural firefighters to be very good structural firefighters in a burn building, and that's what we do. But wildfire is a landscape scale problem, and the only way to become good at fighting wildfires is to go fight wildfires. So when the fire danger is low, Part of what we do for our training programs is we send guys out, the fuels crew members will sometimes detail in with the module, and they go out and they learn how we fight wildfires where the wildfires are burning. Um, so that's a pretty integral part of our training program, and it's pretty critical because without, you, I mean, you truly cannot know how to fight wildfire and what wildfire is like with that landscape scale problem until you fought a wildfire. Um, so, uh, you know, essentially, uh, with that, just wanting to wrap it into when the fire danger is high, like right now, all of that expertise, all of that time on a wildfire, and knowing how to make those decisions and those critical uh, tactical and strategic decisions that we have to make with those wildfires is the resource that you have here in the district. Um, so right now, a couple of the things that I wanted to touch on was recent stops that we made and some of the benefits that the crews are able to bring to the district. Uh, just in the last six months, we've had there was the um, there was the Stonegate fire on the east side of the districts, uh, the West Ranch fire, and then more recently was the Snowy fire, and uh, we just had that Wombly fire last weekend. Wildland Division resources were on all of those, along with all volunteers and other responders who did a fantastic job. Um, but those are success stories for what we've been doing as a district, and in cooperation with Inner Canyon, because we're able to take our expertise. And the, uh, the ability to be specialists, which is something that the, the board and the citizens and the chief has given us, is, is the ability to specialize in this. Uh, and we're able to use it operationally on fires to keep fires small. So, um, you know, the Wombly fire is a great example uh, recently because we were able to have resources on the fire in minutes. Uh, we were able to provide a quick response um, from, all, from multiple different agencies as well as uh, volunteers and wildland division resources. And three outbuildings I was on the fire were immediately threatened. Fire had burned uh, up to the base of three of those buildings. And then when I got there, the fire was spreading rapidly uphill towards another structure. And by the time the fire was, was checked up and even within a few hundred feet of the structure, we already had resources at that structure and prepared to defend it as well. So um, that kind of wraps up what I wanted to talk to you about, again, like I said, I'm really proud of what we're doing here. I'm really passionate about it. I can talk for 45 minutes, but I won't. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's all I have for you. Jason, thank you very much. Yeah. Between you and Captain Yellen, and I also appreciate what Tom said, you guys really have it going on in the chief's direction. I, uh, and your crews, they need to be applied. And we are in a better position as a community because of what Chief and you and Captain Yellen are. Yeah, thank you. And I guess the last thing I'll tag on to that that I had in my notes was um, I cannot express my appreciation to the board and to Chief and Captain Elon and the citizens as well uh, for supporting us and enabling us to do this. Like I said, I'm highly passionate about our responsibility to provide these resources and to do this work because no one else is going to do it for us. The, you know, the, the federal government's not going to come in here and fix the problem for us. So the fact that we have your support to do these things that many other districts would be hesitant to support and would be hesitant to do, uh, 
to face up to the problem that we face, I, I, I can't agree. I can't express my gratitude enough. Either, so thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Chief and Jason, thank you both very much. All right, so item number eight, we are going to go into executive session. Chief Ware, I would ask your personnel to escort all of the um, all of our citizens outside and make sure the doors are closed. And um, uh, to do that, I will take a motion. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but I wanted to create some ground rules first. Uh, Sharon, if you wouldn't mind, after we get the motion, if you would take the camera, Chief, if you would be so kind as to close the owl down. All right. And then I will take the motion to move into executive session. The recording has stopped. Sorry. I'll make a motion. All right. Moving Director Woods makes a motion. A second, please. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Kimmel, if you would stay in um, excessive session with us, please. Yeah, just for the record, uh, I believe the intent of the executive session is to go into executive session under 24-6-4024-B for purposes of receiving legal advice from the district's legal counsel on the election process. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we are going to call the meeting back to order at 723. And that moves us out of the executive session into old business. First item of old business is the consolidation report. Chief Blair? Um, give me one yes, second. Sir. Let me actually get the uh, meeting fired up for everybody to start recording again. This meeting is being recorded. There you have it. <laughs> Just so you know, she does that every day. <laughs> For sake of the recording, we have started the meeting back at uh, 7.23, and the executive session has ended. We're now in old business, and the chief is going to start the consolidation report. Perfect. Uh, so the consolidation report, you know, as, as I mentioned before, a lot of the uh, perfection districts were having elections possibility of changing members, so we kind of didn't do a whole lot of last month. Same with this. Uh, we are, next month, we'd like to get our meetings going again, and we've actually got some direction and some structure we're going to start pushing out. Uh, we st we're still meeting once a week. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at right now is to consolidate our uh, our fleet maintenance. We're already doing it 50-50 with Inner Canyon. We've approached North Fork and Indian Hills to see if they'd be interested in that, and then building out the program. So that's going to be probably one of the next, I don't know, projects with consolidation. They, and that's more operational with, with, within the fire chiefs, but that's going to be something that the boards will be discussing. So once the elections are all finalized, we're going to start getting those meetings again with the boards and get back at it. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second issue in old business, item number two, is the election process and election update by our legal counsel, Mr. Camille. Would you please give us an update on the status of the election? Certainly. Um, you can stand or sit or sit with us if you want. So, yeah. Good evening, everyone, board members. So, uh, I was here two months ago? Was it just last month? Right. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, but uh, I'm legal counsel uh, for the Elk Creek Crop Protection District. I'm an attorney with the law firm Lyons Gaddis, primarily based in Longmont, Colorado. Um, and so I've been assisting in the background uh, with the district's DEO as we move through the election process. So as uh, hopefully all of you know, uh, election day was last Tuesday, May 3rd. Um, so we got through that process. Um, that's all kind of the election judge part of the process, if you will. So that's basically the election day, confirming people uh, can vote, casting ballots at the polling place, collecting those last absentee ballots that come in. And then, of course, you have the vote count. Um, what is posted out on the front door I saw uh, as I was coming in um, is the unofficial abstract. Um, so that's the basically the preliminary vote count, if you will, from election night. Um, one of the unique things um, about election law, you know, you have always kind of have the federal interplay, and there's uh, um, a federal law called the UOCAVA Act, which is the basically absentee protection, absentee voter protection for <coughs> uniformed and overseas individuals. And so at the beginning of the election, 
you have uh, a list, the DEO gets a list of uh, anyone that's a registered elector in your district but is stationed um, overseas somewhere, and they still get the ability to vote <coughs> in local elections. Um, so ballots are prepared, they're mailed all over the world, <laughs> um, and so uh, there's a kind of a, a lag period because um, the federal law, again, protecting these, ability, these individuals' abilities, uh, individuals ability, uh, the right to vote, um, you have to have this waiting period since you're sending them all over the world. There's an eight-day waiting period for UOCAVA ballots that can actually come back after election day. So you have that unofficial count, but technically you still have these UOCAVA ballots that could come trickling in. Um, most of the time it would be the mail ballots. Technically there is now an email option <laughs> under the UOCAVA Act. Um, and there are certain protections that go into that, but typically what you see is those mail returns that can come back in that eight-day period. Um, that eight-day period, uh, once it ends, um, triggers kind of the, the finalization process, um, which is the final reconciliation. So the election judges will come back, so the same individuals that handle the count on election night, um, they come back, they confirm if they got any additional UOCAVAs, they'll finalize their documentation, make sure there's a reconciliation, uh, preliminary reconciliation of the ballots, so making sure that basically all the ballots that went out uh, confirmed as cast, you know, came back basically. Um, so there's, unfortunately, there's always absentee ballots that get mailed out and never returned. Um, there's, unfortunately, a lot of UOCOP ballots that get sent out and never returned. So the reconciliation is primarily the polling place component. You know, we had this many ballots, we issued uh, this many actual voted ballots, and we got the same on the back end as part of our reconciliation. So that's kind of the initial saying, you know, basically we're all square with the election. Um, so all the ballots are accounted for, so basically that means that the vote, you know, the vote count looks good, essentially. Um, the next step after the election judges do that um, is that the Canvas Board meets. Um, the Canvas Board is made up of the, the DEO, the designated election official, um, a non-candidate board member, and a non-candidate eligible elector from the district. So those three individuals make up the Canvas Board. They meet separately, and all they do is, is kind of confirm the reconciliation. So they're confirming the numbers. Um, so they get everything the election judges got, um, and they, they have the election judges' documents that they prepared as kind of finalizing everything. Um, the Canvas Board will look at all that, and essentially, ideally, <laughs> most of the time, when everything looks good, it's a fairly short meeting, and they certify the results as final at that point. So that's all, at this stage, that's all the Canvas Board is gonna do. They're just certifying those results as final, um, basically based on a confirmation that the numbers are reconciled and, and basically the vote count is accurate. Um, so uh, the election judges um, held their me initial meeting this morning, um, and the Canvas Board is meeting uh, tomorrow morning to do the actual reconciliation and finalizing the results. So that's kind of where we are at this point. So technically, as of right now, the election is not final. Um, it's not final until the Canvas Board certifies those results as final. And that's what would then trigger any either additional process. Um, I know that right now the unofficial results uh, reflect a tie in a, a particular race. Um, so it's not until we get through this final reconciliation um, and the Canvas Board actually certifies the results as final that we determine possible next steps. Um, <laughs> and uh, basically the two options in, in this regard is, you know, if you have a tie, there's a certain tie procedure that you follow. If you have a close race, then you do a calculation. Um, if it's uh, within uh, half a percentage point, basically, then you will do an automatic recount the district would pay for. Um, if it's outside of that difference, um, based on the final results, then the, any candidate has the option to um, provide a notice that they would like a recount. Um, if that's the case, the candidate has to pay for the cost of the recount. So right now, you know, again, we're kind of waiting on this final reconciliation and making sure the results are final. Then we'll move into the next steps of determining what potential process would come after that. Um, both the tie procedure and the recount procedure are overseen by the Canvas Board. Um, if we actually go to a recount, there'll be kind of a lot more process, of course, that follows that. They, if there is a, a formal recount, um, the Canvas Board can appoint additional judges to help them. There will be different 
judges than those that help on election night. Um, again, to kind of maintain the separation and the fairness of the recount process. Um, so ultimately, that kind of that's the lay of the land at this point. Um, and so right now, again, we're still just waiting for the, the final step of actually certifying the results as final tomorrow, and then we'll take what comes after that. So um, I don't know if there's any specific questions from the board or any other component, but that's that's the process to this point. Thank you. That's very really comprehensive. All right, that moves us out of old business into um, our 10th item agenda, a new Greg, business can, first. Can we ask a question from the... No, so, uh, Mr. Nib, we will hold questions okay. off until citizens issue. All right. Thank you, sir. John's going to stick, right? Yes, sir. Yes. Good. All right. Uh, in new business, we'll start off with the SDA workshop. Who wanted to talk about I'm happy to speak to that. I don't know. Um, Jake, have you had an opportunity to look at that at all? I have not. Yeah, that's fine. <clears throat> um, the Special District Association of Colorado puts on a series of workshops for board members and staff of the special districts every year. Um, being that we are super close to the June 10th one, it is being held at the Evergreen Fire Training Building with their big, giant, beautiful auditorium. Um, it's from 8 to 12.30 on June 10th. Um, the cost is $30 per person. I am already going to be there for other reasons, but I strongly encourage all of um, the board members to attend, and I would strongly encourage Jake and Barb to attend as well. The amount of information that is presented during these workshops is immense, and the opportunity to ask questions from the SDA is a, is a huge boon. Um, so that one's the first one, and it's the closest here on June 10th. If that one doesn't work for you, there's another one in the Denver. There's like, I don't know, 12 all over the state. Durango, if you want to go to Vail, there's one in the Vail. Um, but there's one in Denver off a county line on June 23rd um, from 8 to, 8 to 12.30. So again... There's another op opportunity for you. Um, I know that Jake has SDA access, and I'm pretty sure, Barbara, you do as well, correct? Yes. To the SDA? Yes. Um, so I would recommend, if you can get it into your schedule, it's worth it's worth every minute that you spend there. The network opportunities alone, as far as like having more people to ask questions and bounce and get ideas from. <clears throat> Perfect. So that will we'll put that across um, an email chain with the directors and see what availability mm -hmm. and what um, when we can if we either do the Evergreen or the Denver facility yeah. that, that would be convenient for all of us. Mm -hmm. All right. I mean, if you want to go can you I think I received an email. Can we just get that specific okay. information on those two? Yeah, now it is. Yeah, absolutely. All right, thank you. The next item is the sale of the vehicles, Chief. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to ask the board for a motion to surplus uh, two more vehicles. Last month they asked for the uh, Tech 6 engine. Um, we've got two command vehicles. One of them is you usually try and run vehicles for 10 years. We have a 2013 Chief Grand Cherokee that is just because it's getting its third motor next week. Um, <laughs> It really is not an ideal piece of equipment for us. So what we'd like to do is surplus those two vehicles, and with that, as well as the sale of Type 6, I'm going to come back to the board and ask if we can purchase another hybrid Ford Escape. So tonight what I'd like is a motion to be able to surplus those vehicles. It's a, well, the other one is a 2011 uh, Chevrolet Suburban. Um, it's I don't know, it has many miles on it. It's, it's, it's fairly tired. It's, 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 so tired. it's reached its... 10 year lifespan, it's time to retire that one. The other one, it, it's got lower miles, it is just, it's it's cursed. So, I'd like so to give it a Chief, it was a 2011 Chevy Suburban, and what year was the Jeep? Uh, 2013 Jeep Grand Cherokee. Okay. All right, could I get one of my fellow board members to make a motion for the sale of, of a 2013 Chief, or excuse me, Jeep Cherokee and a 2011 
Chevy Suburban for surplus. So moved. Second. Second. All right, all in favor. Aye. Second comment into the world. And on the condition that you do not let Kevin bite either one of those vehicles. I can't control what he does. Jake. <laughs> We'll take the money. Again. <laughs> I, I, I'm with Director Wagner. <laughs> if I see one of those. Three quarter time. All right. So the, <laughs> the third item in new business is uh, House Bill 211110. And did you want to talk? To I you? am happy to talk to okay. the board and the community about it. But I do believe Ms. Trilk would be better suited for that conversation. As she is not only with SIPA, but I am guessing well versed in the language. <laughs> kind of sort. Um, and I will back her up. <clears throat> so, I, one of my other jobs is I work for the statewide Internet Portal Authority. And our role, we were um, brought into existence in 2004 by state statute. And our role is to help local governments, special districts improve their presence online, getting websites, doing online forms, payment processing, anything that would help them connect with the constituents and residents and serve their, their community better. So we offer this service for free, and it's no cost whatsoever to get a new website or to do payment processing or online forms. All you have to do is submit a request to um, SIPA, and along with a form that states that you are an eligible government entity, and then we start the process through of building that website, which um, since we both have experience building those websites, both Director Devaney and I could actually do that and get it cranked up pretty quickly. So I could send that paperwork over for um, review and approval at any time. Most importantly though, and the reason this is time I wanted this brought forward is we are at the two year countdown for House Bill 21 1110, 11, which is an act, an accessibility um, amendment. So your website, any government website anywhere in the state of Colorado, has to be auditorial, uh, auditorially compatible with um, anybody who is has vision impairment. Um, and not only does it have to be compatible, every single page, every single form, every, every thing about it has to be compatible. And it has to be vetted monthly. And if it's not, the district can actually be sued. Yes. Or not be compatible. Repetitively. $6,500. Um, is it every, daily or monthly? I can't remember. On the scams? Uh, on, on the... Whoever on the scans, it's monthly. You have to have a monthly a monthly reconciliation that you have scan the website. Here's your score, and there's tons of resources for scoring. Um, there's free Google Lighthouse will do it. There's agencies that have partnered with SIPA that will do it for a fee, a low cost fee. Um, but it ha you have to be able to prove that you are doing this monthly. Um, otherwise, there are agency, there are people out there, there are groups out there anywhere in the world, in the world, can can go to your site and scan it and say, I can't access, I can't access this piece, and you have to pay them, and they and they can do it all the time, every month, until it's fixed, and it's not ideal, and it's not awesome, and it. It can be really painful, but we have two years to be compliant. And we are working with the Office of Information Technology. Our platform is already there, accessible, mm -hmm. and we're doing more steps to get more pieces of it accessible as well. One of the so it should be built in. Yeah, and one of the one of the reasons I involved Sharon is to talk about SIPA because we Evergreen Metro and West Jeff and Kittredge all converted their website over to the SIPA based platform. Mm -hmm four years ago, um, and without doing anything, without making any adjustments, we've scanned 60% of our pages and we're scoring at 90%, which is within the acceptable threshold, without doing anything. So um, all of that is already built in, so I strongly 
encourage the district to move. And if you'd like to see some examples, Foothills Fire is on our platform, and West Metro just got their website up a few weeks ago. Evergreen Metro's is awesome, too. We have Trish Coverly, webmaster on the course. And it's so super easy to update and navigate. Yes. Thank you, Sharon. Are you? Did you sign me? We haven't signed anything yet. We, we've been exploring options, and that was the one after learning more about the accessibility thing that just seems to be Why would you not? Exactly. Yeah. And plus, you get a background uh, DACA website. It's all covered. <clears throat> it's all Colorado Secure. From what I interpret, this does not take a board motion. This is something that we would just ask the chief and you. I've, I've kind of already been All right. work. We've been working on a website redesign that's been something we've been tinkering with the last probably two months. We've been talking about what we're going to do with it. Okay. And with all of this, we, you know, I, I attended one of the accessibility trainings online, and th this seems to be the way to go. Um, I do think you do have to sign, have the board approve something because of the SIPA agreement. It has to be a board member who signs the agreement. Yes. So there does have to be an engagement. Okay. Are you in an engagement agreement with SIPA? Uh, we are not. So that would be the piece that the board would approve. There is an engagement contract with SIPA where you agree to join SIPA. Perfect. And that has to be voted on and approved by the board. So we'll, once we get through the process, and we'll take board action. At that yeah, point. probably next month. We'll okay. that put together. All right. Thank you, Director Devaney, and thank you, Sharon. Appreciate that. All right, that moves us into the 11th item, that's citizen issues. Uh, as board president, I'm going to create a, a rule that we, if we have any issues, that the, the issues will be addressed in no more than three minutes, and then those issues will be addressed either by the board or by the chief or the appropriate representative. Um, Moving in that, uh, Mr. Newby, I, uh, you have mentioned that you had a, a, a question that you would like to raise. Yeah, I do have a question. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and start the timer. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Council here uh, a couple of questions. One, um, where is the Canvas Board meeting tomorrow? Who is allowed to attend? What is the process? Uh, specifically, is it a housekeeping process or is it going to be a recount process? Tell us more about what the process is. Um, so, so generally speaking, I don't want to, you know, provide any uh, specific, you know, legal advice anyway. Um, and to my knowledge, I had thought that there was notice going out on uh, at least the location. Um, so, I mean, I know that the, the plan is for the Canvas Board to meet here um, at 8 o'clock uh, tomorrow morning. Um, generally speaking, as a matter of election process, um, the Canvas Board uh, process is a closed process, um, so it's not open to the public. Um, and uh, at this stage in the process, it is purely kind of like... Um, I mean, administrative is, I guess, the best word. It's purely a reconciliation at this point. So tomorrow morning, there is no recount of anything. It is purely going to be a review of the documentation that was provided by the election judges. So that's that's where we're at at this point in the process. Okay, so, <clears throat> so there is a mandatory recount since we have a tie for one board seat. So that recount will not take place to, tomorrow. No, the that, Canvas board meeting. No, it would not. Um, and there's actually um, technically two different processes depending on whether the final certification is a tie um, versus having a difference in the votes. So there's actually there's a potential um, if you have a tie that's finally certified that you would not have a recount. The recount statute talks about a difference in votes and does not reference a tie at all. And there's a separate statute that deals with a process to resolve a tie. So there's actually two different processes. And ultimately, it comes down to that determination 
based on what the final numbers are from the election judges and what's certified as final by the Canvas Board as to what process you fall in there. And it will, it will all be, again, tomorrow is just the reconciliation. If there is an additional process that would come out of that, um, it would all be noticed. So each, if there is either a tie process or a recount process, all the candidates will get notice of it. It will be a separate set time and date. That process, um, depending on the scenario, the tie process would be an open process at that point, that second part of the process. And then if there's a recount, um, I believe it's similar that I, I believe the candidates are actually able to watch the recount with the Canvas board. Um, I have to. I believe it's either that or, or the watch, or a designated watcher. But that would be a separate and distinct process after tomorrow's meeting that every candidate would get notice, and it would be scheduled, you know, reasonably. Ideally, if it's a tie, the, it's a bit of a shorter process, so likely next week at some point. If it's a recount, it's a little bit more of a pro an automatic recount is a little bit more of a process to put it together. But that, that, again, it would be very transparent that everyone would get notice of when it was going to happen. And we'd be very clear about who could attend. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. So, Appreciate it. Yes, sir. My name is Joe. Um, I just wanted to thank Barbara Stockton and thank the chief and the staff for everything they did for the election because I know it really is a pain to do, um, especially if you have been for a while. So, at least. Personally, I want to thank you all for doing that. I have two other quick things because I met a lot of citizens while I was doing this. Um, you might want to spend some time listening to your wildland crew, uh, some of the things that they may need as creature comforts in Station 2, like Wi-Fi and a couple other things because they do hang there a lot and it would be a benefit to keep them close probably. So I've heard things from the crew actually that maybe, I don't know if you know, but maybe a listening session with them about things that would help the crew hang. So uh, the other thing is um, people I talked to, at least a couple said uh, they applied for the academy, never got a notice that they weren't accepted, they heard nothing. It might be nice to just send them a note, thanks, next time maybe apply again, just sort of a common courtesy kind of thing for those applicants that did not make the academy cut. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> Any other issues from the citizen? Any other issues? All right. Well, thank you all very much for our um, one hour and 50 minute meeting. I show the time to be 7.50. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Second. Second. <laughs> you got a motion to adjourn. Adjourn. Thank you.